Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margo, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't you worry. You don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. Today, I am going to continue with my Serial Killer Summer Series. Yes, when I first covered BTK back about a year ago, I told myself I would lay off the serial killers for a while because, woof, I didn't want to cover cases you probably already heard of a million times. But since covering BTK, I have come across many serial killers with a military background, serial killers that I had never even heard of. Thus, I wanted to take some time to do a brief summer of serial killer series. Recently, I covered the likes of The Scorecard Killer, Judy Buenoano, Ronald Gray, John Jubert, and Retta Mays. But today, I'm going to cover yet another serial killer, except this guy preyed on college co-eds near the University of Florida campus. His reign of terror in Florida lasted but 72 hours. But you know what? 72 hours was enough for parents to quickly return to the campus to pick up their kiddos because Who wants to take a chance to meet a serial killer face to face? Join me today as I discuss the Gainesville Ripper. Now, let's dig in. This story was researched and written by one of our very own listeners and fan club members, Myrtle. The sources for this episode include a television episode of ABC 2020 titled The Devil in Gainesville, newspaper articles from the Southern Florida Sun Sentinel, the Shreveport Journal, the Times, Shreveport, Bossier City, the Orlando Sentinel, the Miami Herald, web sources, biography.com, allthatisinteresting.com, a Radford University Department of Psychology paper, and various YouTube videos. In addition to the ABC 2020 episode, which aired recently in April of 2021, there is also an episode of Oxygen's Mark of a Killer on this exact story. I haven't watched it yet, but it might be a good watch for anyone who's interested in learning more since Oxygen produces excellent documentaries. Warning, this episode contains graphic depictions of murder, mutilations, and rape. While the descriptions will be minimal, listener discretion is advised. Picture this. A 17-year-old girl is home alone. It's dark outside and she's in the kitchen making some popcorn while she's waiting for her boyfriend to come over to watch a movie. The phone rings. She answers, hello? A raspy voice on the other end says, hello back. The line is silent for a moment. She's like, yeah? The person on the other line says, who's this? The teenager asks, Who are you trying to reach? The guy asks, what number is this? They banter back and forth until the girl says, forget it. She gets frustrated and she hangs up. She continues to do her thing with the popcorn and the phone rings again. And she answers and the conversation again goes nowhere with this stranger. The phone rings again. She answers the same guy. They talk for a little bit, but the cycle continues again and again and again. Finally, he asks her what her name is. She coyly asks, why do you want to know? He says, I want to know who I'm looking at. Wait, what? Someone was outside her house looking in while talking to her on the phone. The teenager runs, quick locks the door. But was it too late? Could someone already be in the house? It all sounds terrifying. Well, that scene might sound familiar because it played out for millions of horror film fans in 1996 as the opening sequence from the movie Scream. The first 12 minutes of this movie is some of the most suspenseful in movie history. Scream is an absolute cult classic. It was extremely popular and immediately followed by three sequels. 
plus word on the street is that there's a reboot coming out in 2022. Well, it makes you wonder what could have influenced the screenwriter Kevin Williamson to come up with such a scary script? Well, it turns out this story was actually inspired by true events that Kevin learned about while watching a news program in 1994. The story was about a man who was watching women through windows at night and sneaking into their homes to rape, maim, and kill them. The press dubbed this killer the Gainesville Ripper, but the killer wasn't stalking high schoolers to get revenge like Ghostface was in Scream. No, no, no. The Gainesville Ripper was choosing his college age victims at random. And during a 72 hour long killing spree in 1990, this guy nearly shut down one of the nation's largest universities. The University of Florida is located in Gainesville, Florida, and it is well known for its research department, its football team, the Gators, and what a lot of college students look for in a school. It's known for its epic parties. Gainesville has a small town feel to it. No tall buildings, lots of houses and apartments, and there's like massive woods that surround the area. It's easy to forget that you're in a town at all once you walk into these woods because they're so thick that when you walk in, you like get lost. Every year during the month of August, as happens in all universities, an influx of students in town changes this sleepy town feel into a bustling and busy one. In 1990, one of the students was a girl by the name of Christina Powell. She was 17 years old and she had just graduated from the Episcopal High School in Jacksonville, where she played softball and volleyball. Christina was beyond excited to start her college career as a Gator. She was majoring in architecture and she had a dream of building low-income housing for those people in need. Christina's parents had promised her that they would pay all of her college expenses while she attended college, which I am just like, whoa, Christina, you are lucky. Well, her parents knew how excited she was to be a Gator. So for her high school graduation, they bought her this gold necklace, which she never took off. Another 1990 incoming freshman was Sonia Larson. She was 18 years old. She was incredibly sweet, a little reserved, and she loved to work with children. Initially, she majored in science and engineering, but she told her family that she wanted to switch to elementary education. Sonia was the youngest of four children, and she was very close with her mother, Ada, who called Sonia the dream child. Ada and her husband tried to find Sonia a campus dorm room to live in, but by the time they signed up, all the campus dorms were taken. Ada hated the fact that her daughter was forced to live off campus, but albeit that's what she had to do. As luck would have it, Christina and Sonia met over the summer while taking some classes and they hit it off. They decided they wanted to be roommates. They found a place at the Williamsburg Village Apartments and they promptly moved in on Friday, August 24th, 1990. Well, the following morning, Christina's brother and sister-in-law, they had plans to drop off some of Christina's bedroom furniture and a few other things that Christina might need in her new apartment. When they arrived that Saturday morning, they knocked on the door and Christina and Sonia didn't answer. Christina's brother noticed that there were tons of notes like these post-it notes on the door from friends telling the girls about various parties and get togethers that they were going to go to the night before. Well, Christina's brother contacted Christina's parents to say, hey, the girls aren't home and they're not answering the door. But at this point, no one could reach the girls in the apartment because they didn't have a phone. Remember, they had just moved in on Friday night. It was only Saturday morning and they hadn't had a phone installed yet. Well, you know, it's 1990. Cell phones are ridiculously expensive at this point and they're really a rarity. So Sonia's mother, Ada, and Christina's parents, they got on the phone with each other and the Powells decided to drive down to the apartment since they lived closer to Gainesville. The following day, August 26, it was Sunday, the Powells arrive and they ask a maintenance worker, hey, listen, our daughter isn't answering the door. Do you mind opening up her apartment for us? Well, the worker didn't feel completely comfortable, so he contacted his manager who advised him, hey, listen, before you open anything, call the police first and have an officer escort you inside. So that's exactly what they did. And the police didn't 
care. They came down and they were like, okay, fine. We'll escort this apartment complex worker. So the maintenance worker unlocks the door and enters the apartment, quickly followed by the police officer and the apartment manager. Christina's family stays out back and they don't come in. But the scene that the trio walked into, they would never wish on their worst enemy. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual, because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day, so you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now, and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. As the manager walked in, she saw one of the teen girls on the floor in what she would later describe on this ABC 2020 special as the girl being in a, quote, bad position. Later in the day, during a news interview, the manager was visibly upset and she really struggled to find the right words to describe exactly what she saw. The maintenance worker saw the girl, ran back outside and down the stairs screaming, oh God, oh God, and promptly threw up. Christina's parents actually saw this while they were sitting on the stairs near the door. And immediately they knew something was very wrong. Can you imagine what these parents were thinking? Seeing this maintenance guy running from their daughter's apartment, shouting and puking. The responding officer quickly called dispatch, requesting a supervisor and crime scene technicians to get their ASAP. The deputy that responded said it was the worst crime scene they had ever seen. The girls, as you can imagine, were dead. And the killer, it seemed, had gained entry through the back door. They found Christina. She was downstairs near the couch she had been sleeping on. Because remember, she didn't have a bed yet. Her brother was going to bring it the following morning. Christina had been raped and stabbed multiple times. And sadly, her nipples had been cut off. A towel was found next to her body, along with a bottle of dish soap. The soap, it appeared, had been used to clean up her body in an apparent attempt to remove physical evidence. Upstairs, the graphic scene continued. Sonia's body was found on her bed. She had been stabbed and slashed multiple times, but she had been posed in like a different type of manner. Her feet were on the floor and her legs were splayed open and her nude body was laid back on the bed and her hair was fanned out behind her as she lay. Both girls had remnants of duct tape on their mouths and hands, but the duct tape was nowhere to be found in the apartment. From looking at the crime scene, the police, they had this strong feeling that the killer knew what the police would be looking for, and the killer had used forensic countermeasures to prevent the police from identifying him, which was terrifying. Even more terrifying was the discovery of a third college victim, but not a University of Florida student. Within a few hours of finding Christina Powell and Sonia Larson, police found Krista Hoyt. Krista Hoyt was 18 and had recently graduated from Newberry High School in Archer, Florida. 
She was attending Santa Fe Community College and she was studying biochemistry while she was working at nights as a records clerk for the county sheriff's office. Krista's stepmother described in this 2020 special that Krista was a happy person and she always had a smile on her face. Since freshman year in high school, Krista had said she wanted to be a police officer, but her dreams would be cut short. On the evening of Saturday, August 25th, Krista didn't show up for her night shift at the station. Now, this was highly unusual for Krista as she was always on time. And on this occasion, she never called in to report her absence. So they sent out a patrol to her apartment to check on her. One of the deputies who was dispatched to check on Krista, she worked closely with Krista at the office, remember, because she was working at the sheriff's office. And this deputy, Gail, had a feeling she had like this trepidation as she drove to Krista's house. When the two-person patrol arrived, one patrolman used his flashlight to look in through the blinds on the sliding glass doors, and he saw something. Just then, he looked back at his partner, Gail, and told her, you don't want to see this. Krista, just like the two other college co-eds, had been killed, but her body wasn't just laying there. No, she had been decapitated and her head was sitting on a shelf facing the door. Her body was sitting up on the edge of the bed, slumped forward with her feet on the floor and her legs spread open, just like in the other crime scene. While her ultimate cause of death was determined to be stabbing, she had been also sexually battered for hours before finally being stabbed and mutilated. Three dead co-eds in less than 48 hours. The University of Florida and Santa Fe Community College were within a 30-mile radius, so you can imagine the folks were on edge. Police quickly picked up on the similarities between the three murders. There was a long knife that had been used during both crime scenes on all three women. Their hands had been taped together with duct tape, but guess what? Duct tape was nowhere to be found at either scene. It looked like a screwdriver had been used to pry the doors open at both apartments. Students and the entire city of Gainesville were on high alert. People couldn't sleep. Students were skipping classes to stay holed up in their rooms, and they were begging their parents, please, please come pick us up. Come pick us up. Everyone was worried. Would they be next? In the middle of the chaos of three dead co-eds, a bank was robbed in Gainesville, just a few miles from Krista's apartment. The robber was wearing a ski mask and brandishing a gun. The tellers loaded up a bag with money, but one of them got lucky and she was able to slide in a red dye pack with the money. The robber said on his way out, have a nice day, y'all, and left with the bag. What? So this robber was like, have a nice day. What a polite dirtbag, right? So later that evening, a police officer spotted a white male going into the woods and he got suspicious. The guy must have looked, I don't know, at a place or something. So the officer decided to follow this man and tracked him until he came across a campsite in the woods. But by the time the officer got to the campsite, the man was gone, but he had left behind a bag. In it were bundles of money sprayed with, you guessed it, bright red dye. The officer also found a gun, a screwdriver, and a tape recorder with a tape inside. Now, the evidence was all packed up, it was tagged, and it was put in storage. This tape recorder and the tape that was inside of it, however, no one listened to it. They just put it in storage, in evidence, I guess. Now, the bank robber had escaped but hopefully they could use the evidence eventually to convict him if they ever caught him. Well, the next day, Gainesville would forget all about that bank robbery because the town had more pressing crimes to worry about when two more bodies were found. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. 
By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. Nearby in the Gatorwood apartment, 23-year-old Manny Taboda and his roommate, 23-year-old Tracy Paulus, had been murdered. Now, a lot of people assumed that the pair was dating, but they weren't. They had known each other since high school and they were close, but that was it. Manny was studying to be an architect. Before attending the University of Florida, he had attended Miami-Dade and Santa Fe Community Colleges. Manny was tall, handsome, and athletic. He had acted in school plays and he was on the student council and he played football in high school. According to his brother, he was excited to be finishing college and moving on into a career after taking a break from classes. Tracy, well, she was from Palm Springs North and she graduated from American High School. She was homecoming queen, class president, and she played varsity soccer and softball. She was also a member of the Crime Watch Club, so she was a true crime junkie. I imagine she would have loved all the true crime podcasts and TV shows that we all listen to and watch today. Tracy was super close to her sister, Lori. And when they were younger, they would make up dance routines together and dance in front of their families. Now, their father always begged them to perform the dances for friends and additional family. And the girls even did one of their dances at Tracy's sister's wedding, where Tracy was, of course, the maid of honor. At the time of her murder, Tracy was studying pre-law at the University of Florida. Upon discovering Manny and Tracy, the crime scene investigators put together what they thought happened based on the evidence. It looked like the killer had opened a door with a screwdriver, just as in the other two crime scenes. Manny was asleep downstairs in his bed and the killer attacked him first, stabbing him while he slept, but not before putting up a good fight. The killer then went after Tracy. Her body was found on the living room floor. She had been raped, stabbed, and her body was displayed the same as the other three girls who had been killed. Her hands had been bound with duct tape, just like the other victims, but the killer had taken the duct tape with him. As the police put the information together, it all pointed to the same killer. All four girls were petite brunettes. A screwdriver had been used to break into the apartment and duct tape had been used to bind them, but the duct tape had been taken by the killer. Further, they all had been put on display in a shocking, lewd and vulgar manner. And all the apartments were close to the woods. Now, the proximity to the woods gave the killer a good vantage point to watch the apartment without being seen. And it gave the killer the ability to slip away into the darkness after he was done. At this point, there were five dead college students in the span of only three days. The entire city of Gainesville was trapped by terror. Parents, as I said earlier, flocked to the college to scoop up their kids and take them home because the risk was just too great. According to the ABC 2020 special, people were buying guns and taking shooting lessons they were also arming themselves with knives and stun guns. And the college students who didn't go home 
Well, they were bunking up and packing into apartments six to eight people deep because they were wondering maybe they could be safer in larger numbers. Now, one reporter compared the frenzy of buying locks and other security devices as the same as preparing for a hurricane. I mean, people were literally buying everything out of the hardware stores. Meanwhile, the Gainesville Police Department tripled in size. They were getting help from everyone, the state police, the FBI, and even the National Guard. They all descended on the town to assist in this manhunt. Police officers were working 12-hour shifts without days off, patrolling the two-mile area where the murders had taken place. Of course, like with any sensational story, the news media took the town by storm. As the police ran down leads, according to the 2020 episode, Reporters were hot on their heels trying to land interviews with whoever had spoken to the police. It was national news and reporters did everything they could to get an edge on the competition. They wanted to score the big story. The Gainesville chief of police actually was even bribed with the promise of an offshore account if he gave them any information. The police department at this point, they knew they needed to make an arrest soon. Enter a college age man by the name of Edward Humphrey. Edward Humphrey was a freshman at the University of Florida, and he had previously lived in the Gatorwood apartments, the same ones that Manny and Tracy had lived in and the ones where they had been murdered in. When Ed was in high school, he had been in two horrific car accidents. In the first accident, he was ejected from a moving car and he had to recover from devastating injuries. In the second accident, just a year later, he hit a telephone pole and he went through the windshield. Largely because of these head injuries that he had received in these accidents, he went through what people describe as a personality change. Hello, traumatic brain injury. Well, his face was also covered with these deep scars from going through this windshield, right? He also had to take lithium for bipolar disorder. Well, It turns out that a few weeks before the murders, the neighbors would report that they heard Ed screaming and yelling at a letter that he had gotten out of the mailbox. He was screaming at a freaking piece of paper. Now, the neighbors didn't know what it said, but they said that Ed was in a rage and the letter was the recipient of all of his anger. In addition to his personality change and his public displays of anger towards inanimate objects, Ed was seen hanging out in the woods in the weeks leading up to the murders. But not only was he willy-nilly going into the woods, he was usually seen dressed in camouflage, which made people weary of him. Oh, and by the way, he also loved to carry knives. So of course, these murders happen. They're all murdered with knives. People are seen going into the woods and the name Ed Humphrey gets to the police. At this point, Ed had stopped taking his medication and he was in a manic state. It was then that Ed attacked his 79-year-old grandmother. He was hitting her in the face, causing extensive damage, including broken bones. I mean, this Ed guy, he was out of control. And in his frenzy, he was threatening to cut phone lines, to kill his mother, to kill his grandmother. I mean, he was just like, he had literally hit rock bottom. After he attacked his grandmother, Ed was taken into custody and booked on assault charges. And since he was off his medication, when he was arrested, he had this like blank, vacant look in his eyes. People said he looked so scary with that blank stare and horrible scars that they actually thought this guy must be the killer. So police started to look into Ed as the possible murder of the five co-eds. And when they looked, The police indicated that they had found physical evidence that allegedly tied Ed to some of the crime scenes. That physical evidence, carpet fibers and hair. But listen, y'all, it's 1990. Forensics in 1990 wasn't what it is today. They couldn't prove that the hair belonged to Ed, but they also couldn't prove that it didn't belong to him either. But even with this skimpy evidence 30 years ago, It was enough to lock Ed in as a solid suspect. That's crazy. And with that, after he was arrested for assaulting his grandmother, he was held on a $1 million bond. 
which is crazy for assault. But the judge wouldn't budge on the amount. And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, once Ed was arrested, the murders stopped. So this begged the question, was this the right guy? Did the Gainesville police just solve the murders by locking up a guy who beat on his grandma? In 1990, DNA was in its infancy, but investigators could do testing for blood types. That was kind of like the only thing they could do at that point. The killer in this case had used dish soap and a towel to try to clean up the scenes. But you know what? He left behind something he couldn't clean up. He left his semen because remember, he had raped most of these women. Now, the killer was what's known as a secretor. A secretor means that the enzymes from someone's blood will end up in their bodily fluids, including mucus, saliva, and semen. These fluids can be collected from a crime scene and tested to determine blood type. They tested the semen left behind at the three murder scenes in Gainesville, and they determined that the killer had type B blood. So they took a sample of blood from this guy, Edward Humphreys, and guess what? He did not have type B blood. Nope, he had type A blood. Uh Uh-oh, now they had a problem. Edward couldn't be the killer, or at least he couldn't be the rapist, right? Unfortunately for Ed, though, the Gainesville police weren't going to let him go that easily. The police figured, okay, well, maybe Ed didn't rape the girls, but maybe, just maybe, he was still at the murder scenes and participated in the stabbings, right? I mean, they were convinced, the the Gainesville Police Department, they were convinced Ed was their guy, even though at this point, the little evidence that they had pointed to the fact that he wasn't, at least, he wasn't the rapist. I mean, the police are thinking, what are the chances we arrest this guy and the murders all of a sudden stop? Well. Thankfully, a few years earlier in 1985, the FBI instituted a nationwide database, which they called the Violent Crime Apprehension Program, or the VICAP. Now, VICAP was this program used to track criminals who were moving between jurisdictions and and where the FBI would use these similarities in crimes to link crimes together, even if they happened in different jurisdictions. When the information from the five murders in Gainesville was entered into VICAP, it didn't take long before they got a hit. Whoa, what? Wait a minute. You mean there was another murder out there that was similar to the ones in Gainesville, Florida? Yep, but not just one murder. No, there was an unsolved triple murder in Shreveport, Louisiana. This triple murder shared various similarities with what had happened in Gainesville, and those murders took place in late 1989. Nine months before the murders in Florida, on November 4, 1989, 55-year-old William Tom Grissom, his 24-year-old daughter Julie, and 8-year-old grandson Sean, well, they were all spending the weekend together celebrating Sean's birthday. Tom was known as being super friendly and he would do anything for anyone, especially for his family. Now, Sean, the young little boy, he stayed with his grandfather, Tom, often. Most recently was while his dad and stepmom were away on their honeymoon. Tom had been battling throat cancer and thankfully it had gone into remission. He had just returned back to work. Julie Grissom, Tom's daughter, she was a college student and had recently moved back to live with her dad while she was attending classes at Louisiana State University, Shreveport. Julie was also recently engaged. Sean was in the third grade, and he was enjoying all the things that kids love to do. Well, on the morning of Monday, November 6, 1989, police were called to do a wellness check on Tom's house. Police made contact with one of Tom's neighbors because the neighbor had a spare key to Tom's house. As soon as the neighbor opened Tom's door, he saw a body and immediately turned and ran back to his house to call the police. This welfare check did not go well. Police arrive at the scene and just like in the Florida cases, they walk into a nightmare crime scene. 
Julie was found with her body laying on the bed, her feet were on the floor, with her legs spread, and her hair, her hair was arranged, fanned out around her head, just like Sonia Larson's had been at the first crime scene in Florida. Julie's hands had been bound with duct tape and her mouth had been covered, but the tape was missing, just like the crime scenes in Florida. And one last piece of similarity, she had been washed, but she hadn't been washed with dish soap. She had been washed with vinegar. But remember, one of the bodies in Florida had also been washed. Tom and Sean had been stabbed and they had been left to die. There was some forensic evidence left behind despite Julie's body being washed with vinegar. And even with the evidence found, there were no suspects. There were no leads and the Grissom murders went cold. Fast forward a year after the murders in Gainesville and when the cases were linked in VICAP, Florida Department of Law Enforcement sent investigator Don Maines to Shreveport. They sent Maines down to compare notes with the detectives there. While he was there, they discussed the similarities and investigator Maines felt very strongly that the murders had been committed by the same perpetrator. An interesting fact in the Shreveport murder was that Julie had been bitten on the breast during her attack. So they swabbed the bite mark and tested the saliva that was left behind. And what do you know? It had enzymes in it from a person who was a secretor and their blood type came back as type B blood, just like the killer in Florida. Now, I know that's not a lot because there's a lot of people with type B blood, but what a coincidence. The detectives knew at that point, undoubtedly, they were seeking the same killer. Ed Humphrey was no longer a viable suspect, at least not anymore. Now, all that they had to do was catch the actual killer. So they desperately needed a lead, someone who could connect the pieces and point to a suspect who had been in Shreveport in November of 89 and Gainesville in August of 1990 when the murders took place. The person to connect the pieces would be a woman from Shreveport named Cindy Jurachik. In August of 1990, Cindy and her then husband, Stephen Dobbin, they had taken their kids to the Florida Panhandle for a beach vacation. So they're relaxing, kicking back on the beach. And while they're there, they hear about the Gainesville murders. Cindy thought, man, these murders sound super familiar. And as she looked at her husband, it hit her like a ton of bricks. Hold up. Wait a minute. These five murders sounded just like murders that occurred back where she lived in Shreveport. Those murders took place in November of 89. So it hadn't been too long before these murders, maybe nine or 10 months or so. But it wasn't just like, OMG, this is the same killer. No, no, no. Cindy was like, hold up. I know exactly who could have committed these murders. What? Yes, this Cindy lady, she had the lowdown because guess what? This case gets crazier and crazier. Our homegirl, Cindy, she knew who the killer was, or at least she assumed she knew who the killer was. You see, back in Shreveport, she had met a man in church, the man's name, Danny Rowling. When they met, Cindy had really liked Danny and she invited him to come to their house where he became a regular visitor. Danny always talked to her about his future plans. He had these big plans like leaving Shreveport, right? Everybody wants to leave a small town. And even though Shreveport is not the smallest town ever, it's still a smallish town. So in an interview with ABC 2020, Cindy said that Danny told her that he was, quote, going with the girls are pretty and he could just lay in the sun and watch them, end quote. Side note, that's a little bit creepy in my opinion, but Cindy's husband, Stephen, though, he wasn't as cool about Danny as Cindy was. A few months after the triple murder in Shreveport, Danny was hanging out at their house and Danny told Stephen that he had a problem. When Stephen asked, OK, what kind of problem do you have? Danny said, I like to stick knives in people. What? 
what the what? Who actually says that to people? So Stephen immediately was like, this guy is a creeper and he has got to go. Stephen then told Cindy what Danny had said. And he's like, this guy cannot come to our house anymore. But Cindy didn't want to believe him at the time. She didn't want to believe that a young guy that she met at church could be creepy or could be up to no good, right? She thought, no way. He was probably just yanking her husband's chain. Well, back at the beach in Florida, a few months later, the news story about the Gainesville murders ate at Cindy. Five students had been stabbed to death. Danny had told her that he wanted to go where the girls were beautiful so that he could lay in the sun to watch them. And he had confessed to her husband that he likes to stick knives in people. Well, Cindy and her family returned to Shreveport without doing anything after their vacation. And in November of 1990, Cindy decided that the concerns she had about Danny being involved wouldn't let her sleep anymore. So she needed to let the police know about the suspicions she had about Danny. And she did a thing. She called Crime Stoppers. And folks, that is where I leave you today. Join me next week where I will conclude this mini series on the Gainesville Ripper. If you're anything like me and you cannot wait until next week, consider joining me in the Patreon fan club where for as little as $5 a month, you can get immediate access to part two of this episode. In addition to part two, at the $5 and above tier, you get access to at least nine full length bonus episodes and all regular episodes are ad free. I will see y'all next week. But until then, you can find me on social on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast. If you want to see pictures of my beautiful new baby girl, be sure to follow me on my personal Instagram account at Military Margot. That's Military Margot with a T at the end. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my boot camp and hire fan club members. My newest assistant producers are Christopher J, Karma C, Megan L, and Jade R. My newest associate producer is Louis E. And my newest executive producer is Ryan R. Additional executive producers for the show are Alicia H, Falcon 13, Nicole G, and Tina S, owner of Stitch 6 to 6 Embroidery. Thank you to everyone who supports my tiny indie podcast. Most of y'all know that I am no longer on active duty and my goal is to spend more time with my family while continuing to produce this show. And I will do the latter as long as it's feasible. So thank you so much for those of you who support the show. The music on this show was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you the conclusion of this story on the Gainesville Ripper. Let's work on another podcast.